Welcome to the Playground Podcast, AI's Place to Play. Today, we are delightful to have Hugo Contreras in our podcast. Who is Hugo? He is a, sen a senior manager of data science and analytics at the Home Depot. As you might know, the Home Depot is one of the largest retail in the U.S., and from the data science point of view, it is hard to find another company with larger effort and on catalyzing data science talent and applications. Hugo got his PhD in astrophysics at Columbia University in New York and was one of the many scientists with the pedigree from a top university that jumped out of the academy around 2014-2015 in the, into the data science space. He led several data science teams in, in a startup world and global innovation centers previous to, to uh, his current job. Welcome to the playground, Hugo. Hey, Miguel. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How's everything going with you? I'm very good. I'm very good. So let's break the ice with a funny question that I used to do in this podcast. So in terms of sci-fi movies or TV shows or even novels, uh, what is the one that you find more close, closely related to the artificial uh, intelligence world or, you know, the world that you are doing? So actually, my favorite uh, science, science fiction uh, movie um, is Interstellar. Uh, that was directed by Christopher Nolan. We must confront the reality of interstellar travel. I'm coming back. The reason why I love it is because uh, I really like the interplay between science and art. Uh, is is a little bit uh, not not a lot about the artificial intelligence, but for me, it's about you know the this interplay. Uh, between how science and art can share ideas and one can get uh, inspiration from the other. So if you are familiar, there was a lot of um, scientific um, expertise going into that movie mm -hmm. uh, that led some of those rendering of the black hole uh, to be yeah. as realistic as possible. So I really find fascinating the fact that you can draw ideas from science to art and also mm -hmm. use art as a way to bring ideas to science. Yeah, actually it is a challenge for the, the, the person that is in charge of writing the script to take into account all the scientific part of the, of the world that they want to describe. So yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I, I really like it too. Yeah, that, that was a really good. And then when you were reading, uh, you know, all the... Um, computational science and physics that went into rendering the black holes and everything and also the consulting from the you know experts in the field on how that reality would look, would look like and how you can bring it to the screen that was fantastic for me it was one of those things like okay this is more like a thought experiment than a movie <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <clears throat> Okay, so let's let's start with uh, with the beginning of your career in the data science world. So around 2014, uh, you are close to finish uh, your PhD and decide to jump out of the academy world uh, in a brand new space, the data science space. So what was your perception previous to getting into the data science? Oh, that was uh, that's a great question. So, um, yes, as you said, I finished my PhD uh, in January or February 2015. So I started looking for data science jobs probably summer 2014. I realized mm -hmm. that um, I needed uh, to have perhaps like a faster return of investment. In yeah. our in the research, right? So when I was finishing my PhD, um, I saw that the impact of my contribution would, you know, 
I, mean, I would need years to see that come into fruition, right? So one of the things that drove me to data science was, okay, I need a field where I could apply my technical skills and try to solve problems from the industry, but using the mindset of science that we learn right. from a PhD, right? So you need your PhD, that, that, that phase of learning and discovering and that little moment, one moment where you are the only person in the world that knows this little bit of information, right? Like when your research gives you this little of new information. This is what I was, um, uh, wanted to con I wanted to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be honest, the main driver of um, my path to acad from academia to startup was the fact that by 2000, summer 2014, my wife knew that she was going to move to Georgia, Atlanta. So mm -hmm. from New York, I started looking for jobs in Atlanta. It was a long, long process sending emails to startups, applying. Mm -hmm. And um, during that period of time, I had... So, so were you targeting specifically startups or... Anything. But it was anything, anything, but especially I, I wanted startups because I really liked the idea of a fast moving pace mm -hmm. that could adapt really, really uh, fast to new realities, like a small team, uh, mm -hmm. because this is what I thought that was um, uh, very close to my uh, research group, right? So, uh, interesting enough, I would send emails. Ap sorry, apply to positions, open positions, but also send emails to the recruiting co uh, team yeah, and say, yeah. hey, if you ever are looking for a data science, uh, Great hit me strategy. up. And yeah. then one, t uh, one time the CEO of that startup inside pool now, Trenkite, reached out to me. And mm -hmm. after probably six months of interviews over the phone and in person and six rounds of interviews, finally I got my job. And I was the first data scientist um, in the company, uh, mm -hmm. the lead data scientist in the company, and we did really, really good uh, models uh, and really cool stuff. Yeah, actually, I was trying to at that time to be the second one there, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I end up in another marketing, digital marketing company. <laughs> All right, all right. That was funny. That's the way that we met. Yep, correct. Okay, so I think it's beautiful the way that you say that. So you were trying to find a return of investment from your scientific uh, effort in the academia, uh, researching into the industry. But, uh, okay, so you are from Colombia. I'm from Spain. Uh, I didn't have that need when I was in my original country, but when I get into the US, even when I was in the academia, I start thinking on that. It, that was your case? Meaning, uh, you, you, you're asking me when I started thinking about a uh, data science as a career? Uh, about, about, uh, about getting a return, a fast return from your scientific uh, development as a professional. Oh yes, no, definitely was uh, even early on in my career, right? You would like to see the research affecting something, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise it could be just, you know, a curiosity. So would you like to either apply it to something to move the needle or your work is fundamental for the next theory or something like that? So yeah, I always wanted to see my work moving the needle as uh, so to speak uh, so yes um, even early on in my undergrad I I did some my my thesis was about ne uh, small world networks mm -hmm. that was this phenomena of when you have a social or nature network that is well connected then you will have a lot of uh, a very s uh, short path of communication while mm -hmm. having a lot of connection between um, uh, the neighbors. So that was something that I w always wanted to apply 
into mm -hmm. real world if you want. So I thought data science would be the best opportunity for me to apply that into a yeah, real world problem. Definitely, definitely. Actually, that that was my second question. It, it was related with that. So when I, I've, I've, uh, some of the few times that we met in the, in 2015, you I remember you recommend me a book. Do, do yeah. you remember that? So this yes. was the book. This was the book. Correct. I have my book. I have that book in my. Uh, yes. <laughs> so it's uh, networks, crowds, and markets. So I have to say, I mean, it's it's an academic uh, an academic book. So I mean, you can you can both uh, use it for academic, uh, like for lectures, but also to you know to get dirty into these uh, mathematical applications to 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 business use cases. And uh, I mean, I, I thank you so much for re re uh, recommending the book because I I really enjoy reading, and I learn a lot. <clears throat> Sorry, I learn a lot. So, but the the um, the whole thing of this recommendation was we were talking about networks and graphs and the application of these uh, mathematical concepts into. Uh, solutions from for business uh, problems so here is my question uh, this is something that companies have been trying to use in the past they, they were trying to use in the uh, at that time in 2015 and uh, today as well but it doesn't feel that it, it is trendy it is trending <clears throat> so what do you think is that so there are other artificial intelligence uh, tools that became uh, more trending, like uh, deep, deep learning, reinforcement learning, generative adversarial networks, autoencoders, anything. But this is something like it's, it's, it's there. Everybody talks about it, but it doesn't become like that important. Yes, uh, I mean, the thing... The way I see networks is just a model to represent the reality, right? So if you have a bunch, in general, if you have a large number of items, whatever you want to call it, people, products, um, entities, right, that, that have some relationship between them, you could represent them as a network. Now, if you, from my perspective, of course, when you have a small network, it's really easy to understand the dynamics in the network. The minute mm -hmm. you start getting higher and higher in size, it get it becomes computational more expensive, right? Even to the, I mean, worst case scenario, at least n square, right? If you want mm -hmm. to describe all the, um, if you have n elements in the network, at least you, at most you will have n square or the order of the order of n square relationships between that right so it grows really fast so the complexity of those networks grow really really fast uh, as you increase the, the the network so and sometimes it's really hard to generalize knowledge or insight from a small network to a big network mm -hmm. so um yes i i agree with you for me Networks are a way to understand the system, but the system can be so complicated that we, you will need a lot of network models in order to understand the same concept. Um, then it gets really um, computationally expensive. Now, one thing that I will be very, really curious is those network uh, graph knowledge graphs that connect different entities across different uh, domains if you want which even complicate more the structure of the network but i believe this could be a really good technology in the future so one one specific question so how um let me see how i phrase this um how beneficial is to have your information in a network fashion like in a graph instead of in a a traditional database like with tables or relational tables so how that is going to benefit modeling oh i mean personally i believe um, that 
having a network encoding your information is packs a lot of information about the interactions mm -hmm. and then you can zero in on the interactions and not on all the information that you have in, in other words if I am interested on a network and what is the longest or shortest path between two points across the network I don't need necessarily to understand all the, 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 the environment if yeah. I can have the relationships or the other way around if I want to have information only about the, the, the close neighbors there are cases in which the close neighbors are the only thing that affects this network this node and I can forget about the rest now the problem is there are behaviors or patterns that require you to understand the entire network mm -hmm. right I was mentioning uh, the, the, the example of the shortest path you will need necessarily to understand the entire network in order to find the shorter the shortest path. But if you a path, but if you want to describe what is happening locally, you can just zero in on the neighbors. So I love that flexibility, but the challenges are that describing the entire network either requires approximation methods or very, very expensive algorithms. Yeah. Like very expensive in the computational in the computa in, exactly computational time very expensive computational time algorithms. Okay, okay, but do you see like for example, if you are about to model, you you simplify with a specific mathematical use case, which is let's calculate the shorter path. But if it's something a little bit more sophisticated like a, a data science uh, use case where you have to model with uh, machine learning something, right? Do you see that that implicit interaction between the nodes relationships uh, are going to benefit in terms of the discovery of patterns of machine yes. learning? Definitely. One, one, one of the applications that I really like, uh, and get, I would love also to get more uh, into that as in my professional path, is how we can predict the existence of node, of links between nodes that are not present in the network, right? So if you, uh, the, the, the great example with a social network, right? Mm -hmm. If I know that two nodes have these characteristics and based on the on the patterns that I see in the rest of the network, I can predict that a, no, an edge or a link should be present, but it's not. I can recommend something to, to, to link these two. If you are talking about a social network, it could be, you know, I'm gonna send a friend request or suggest a friend request from node A to node B if I know the similar nodes have affinity between them. Yeah. One interesting application that I tried in my previous job with Stanley Black and Decker was uh, the problem of complexity management, meaning when you build uh, equipment, you have what you call the bill of materials, right? Bill of materials is the list of all the items that you need to make that particular uh, okay. product. Say, if you are building a drill, you have the beads, the external case, the, the uh, wire, all the cables and everything. So th that, that's the, list, uh, the bill of material. Mm -hmm. When you are building different versions of the same product, you change a little bit that product, but the essence of the product is the same. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you continue having versions and versions and versions of the same product, you increase the complexity of the production. Yeah. So one question that was asked to the team was how can we merge and cluster existing products into one in order to reduce complexity without losing cells? So yeah. this is a straightforward engineering problem, but the way I tried to approach it was let's consider each product as a node in my network mm -hmm. and I will define, define similarity, meaning how what is the overlapping between the bill of materials between different products and the mm -hmm. highest, higher the overlapping, the strongest the link, yeah. right? Yeah. So I was able to build a network of products and identify the clusters where I had my star product 
And that was my recommendation to the engineering team and the business uh, decision makers. This product is the one that is a big node or hub for this network. Perhaps we can keep this and retire or merge the other. So Beautiful. again, it wasn't necessarily a new approach, a new problem, but it was a new angle that we can bring to the same problem. And I loved it. It gave me a lot of understanding about the building materials. And uh, But again, the problem that you run into is the bigger the, the network, the more computational power you need to do. Um, but I, be, I truly believe there's a, a potential for using AI, machine learning, into yeah. predicting those links. Yeah, and, and don't you feel that there is another benefit on using networks, which is the, uh, f the expose of uh, explanation. So basically... The way that you can explain things that happen in the network is kind of easier because basically if you if you draw the network and you focus the nodes and the interactions and, and you can you can build a story like you say with the with the um, with the the products and the materials and the relationship you can build a story and explain what is going on and the decisions easier. Right. Correct, correct. And, and is it really interesting also sometimes, uh, as you said, the storytelling of data science is so important, right? It's like for, it's, you, you need to have a good storytelling ability for to explain your models and your results to the business people, to the engineering people, to mm -hmm. your peers, right, uh, as data scientists. And then uh, there is one interesting thing, is, is the question about what happens if you remove one node in the, in the network, right? If you have a node that is on the periphery of this network, probably not much is going to happen, right? Because it's out on the boundaries, right? But what happens yeah. if you take, you eliminate one central network, right? Perhaps yeah. you disconnect the network. So making that explanation in those terms gives a different perspective to what is happening in the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. I mean, I, I, I could spend hours talking about this with you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump uh, into, the, into the retail space. Your, your current focus uh, from a pro professional point of view. So uh, what are the data science challenges in, on retail? Okay, so currently, of course, with uh, COVID-19, right? Every okay. industry is thinking about how we can react fast to the ever-changing reality that is happening. And that's happening here in the United States. We need to, uh, you know, track all the news about whether uh, the, the um, stores are being open or not. What are the, um, you know, the limitations on the number of people that can be in the store or not? Uh, mm -hmm. the, all that stuff affect the traffic to the store. All that stuff also affect online purchases, mm -hmm. right? So there is the entire ecosystem that is uh, being uh, affected. affected. And, mm -hmm. and the other thing that's happening right now is that you, in general, rely on historical data to, to build a forecast. Yeah. But during a period as weird and crazy as COVID, how can you draw historical data in order to make decisions about now in a situation oh. that is as fluid as 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 uh, COVID, and it's, it's a it's a problem that is you know present on every single industry, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. COVID is challenge us all, and data science is also part of that. The question that we always try to ask is, how can I use the data that I have right now and make a make an, an analysis that can allow a business person to make the right decision. Like, what is the right uh, insight and information that we should put in front of people in order for them to make the right business decision? So, as a driver for uh, better decisions. Yeah, so, and, and what about uh, zero-shot learning approaches? since we don't have data that uh, has signal from 
the current scenario, which is anomaly, is an anomaly from respect to the history. So instead of using the past data, which is an asset, right? But can we approach in a different way? Like, like, like uh, this uh, pandemic is also uh, introducing another driving force, which is innovation. So let's, if if we are if we are focusing our business uh, or our business focus is on our asset is historical data. Let's build models based on that, learn from that, and apply to the present. So what about uh, these type of approaches, which are relied less on the on the past but more on the present? Correct. No, that's a that's a great question, and that's uh, where the entire same experimental culture comes into play, right? There are many different hypotheses that we as scientists, as data scientists, could have, and also the business could have, and then we can try. We can do like a really short term experiment that allow us to get quick answers, and bring those answers back into our models, and then build a model as we. Go, but exactly what you said, right? Relying less on the past, work on the present, but on a very systematic, experimental kind of way. Yeah. So I, th- I mean, tell me as much as you can <laughs> about, I mean, the Home Depot. As far as I know, they have a lot of talent on data science. Like I have a few other friends there. Uh, probably you know them, Faisan. Yes, Faisan. It's um, great. Yeah, and Khalife. Khalif. Ka- yes, Khalifa. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Khalifa. So, so how's I mean, how is working in the, in the Home Depot from the data science point of view? Like, you guys have an, an ecosystem. Yes, I mean the 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 company is really really great at investing in the right tools for the for the teams to make the right decisions and to you know analyze the data so i really enjoy that also there is a lot of different expertise across the entire company and um, you build your network and then you will find people working on the most you know amazing things ever so in my case specifically i'm more on the merchandising side right so it's less uh on the visual recognition or you know frontier sort of uh, ai but i'm more on the how can we get the real decisions how can we bring the elements for people to make the right decisions and how can we build reliable models that can eventually um, get into the application. Uh, when I say application, is uh, you know it could be the internal facing applications that we can give to our associates and the store to for them to make decisions and help our customers better. But yes, the ecosystem is something that is so important in data science in the sense that uh, when you have a team that you can rely or ask questions or look for direction or share what they are doing is a really really important for any company. So going back to the small world uh, scenario, so you guys have a small world, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 yeah. <laughs> correct, correct. It's a, it is a small world in the sense that it's a big network, but the connection between the networks is good enough. As usual, you might need one person that connects a lot of people. And that's your hub, right? So usually you have your one person or one team that helps connecting other teams. So, so you have been in several industries, right? Uh, like marketing, like, uh, well, in Stanley, Stanley uh, uh, Black & Decker. So it was an innovation center for a company that sell a product or so they, they sell products. Um, and then you have retail, a more retail uh, entity. So, but I, I feel that you have a special ability to translate the network theory into an industry for solutions that nobody has seen before or that not it's not that obvious. So what is the industry that you find a little bit more easier to apply graph theory or network theory? Definitely. Oh, that's a great question. I really... Um... 
the most obvious would be you know marketing right so because mm-hmm. you have perhaps a social set networks of, set, a social network right so uh yeah. when you talk yeah, that, that that's that that's, that, that's the, the prime example right and then uh if you can again encode the information of the community that you want to target in a network and understand what are the stars or champions in that network, then that helps you thinking about how fast the communication is happening through the network or what is the right approach to cover the entire network if you are messaging one particular person. So definitely is the uh, marketing is the one that it speaks to me more more however you know the same could happen if you think about your portfolio of products in retail right if you think about products and then you connect them via sales or say the, the, the typical example might be a market basket analysis right you buy mm-hmm. eggs and bread at the same time so there is a big connection between these two products but you don't sell you don't buy eggs and a computer yeah uh that often so in a network representation eggs and bread should be connected with a stronger link than bread and computers so identifying those networks could help you a look for patterns that you are not seen that should be present there right mm-hmm. so uh, and you, usually you can ask yourself what is your bread and butter and where they are connected and why i am missing that so that's a uh, that's one application that i mean that we've been researching in uh in retail but as i mentioned the bill of material the bill of materials problem was the one that uh, i did in uh, manufacturing yeah and and what about fraud detection uh crime in general actually i I remember the conversation that we had in the past started with crime talking about networks and crime correct Uh, yeah terrorism in, in particular so so do you i mean there are a lot of fraud in different industries right in different ways so do you feel that uh, a network approach bring things uh, that uh, you cannot find in a, do- in a, in a different approach? Yes, uh, I have to say, having, you know, dived in that a particular problem, uh, but it's a really interesting problem. Definitely, once again, uh, fraud detection is an outlier, right? So if you can mm-hmm. identify outliers in the network, it could be I don't know from the pers- from the perspective of what are the typical patterns of one driver or one entity that is having that fraud. So it, let me let me think about an industry in a bank. What is the typical pattern of communication between accounts that mm-hmm. a fraud fraudulent person is you know behaving right so may, perhaps this person is has multiple accounts in a short period of time so that in my the way I would represent it in a, in a, in a network is how many n- links per during yeah. a period of time you can see right mm-hmm. so definitely mapping that into a network would give you at least a good way to grasp the the, 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 the problem yeah I mean I I would like to to be in your brain because you have so it's so easier for for you to think about how to frame the the, the problems based on on this uh, approach. That it's fascinating to 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 hear you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so let let me ask uh, about the future of data science. Okay, so how do you see that future? I mean, you are in an amazing field right now. There is a lot of demand. Maybe that demand is decreasing or stabilizing. Uh, But still, I mean, the industry has a lot of focus on on data science community. So 
So one question, what is exciting for you to think about? So what is exciting, exciting you from the future of this uh, field? And uh, how do you see the future? Okay. In the future, I think the thing that excites me the most about what is going to happen in the next five years is that right now home, um, co um, data science seems to be concentrated on a few people, right? So like um, say the data scientists are the ones that might have the not control but most of the activities around data science mm -hmm. what i'm seeing right now is that college college students are graduating with at least the fundamentals of python and r right mm -hmm. so that means that in the next couple of years we will have what i would expect to to, to be like the critical mass of people that are going to understand or at least learn how to deal with data at large scales mm -hmm. so the data science would be less about generating making accessible insight to the end consumers and more sort of a self self self, self serve approach in which the data science is going to be more on the research side and um, in, in, in other so. words, perhaps my, my, my prediction, I might be completely wrong, is that in a couple of years, um, business schools or business in general are going to perceive Python and R, what they perceive Excel right now, right? It's like a, mm -hmm. you will need to know Python yeah. and R the same way that you need to learn Excel, which means that the entire data capabilities of a company is going to increase dramatically because yeah. then you will have this critical mass of people that know Python and R and they are going to be able to deal with large amount of data without being expert on the field but having the tools to make the right decisions about the data without being concentrated on the data science. Now the data science can be on the higher level if you want making the right discoveries on bringing those connections that are not obvious for the for the for the for the business okay so let me see if i if i understand i i share with you that uh, there are a few tools that will be more integrated into the the employees like uh, programming languages for data processing right because at the end of the day what you are interested in the, in that uh, that asset that you have to be able to process, mine, and extract the use that you need for your business. Uh, and then you say that, that the data scientists will be sh sh uh, moved to uh, other layer in the company where they have to be more focused on research, uh, thinking about problems, Framing the problems, delivering solutions, and in well, that's something like well, that's the way that it was sell the the this job uh, role when I jump into the data science. <laughs> but, uh, but it was not like that. Yeah, I, I, and that's the thing, you know. Uh, for me, um, to be honest, the role of data science and analytics should be combined especially in a company you know like um, uh, in any company but it is a end-to-end -end sort of a journey right the mm -hmm. from data collection data processing learning from the data and communicating those insights back to the uh, data user right and all and also providing the data user with tools to act on the data so what i'm saying is the more the user has those abilities to self-serve and do their own thing, the more the data science community or the AI community could zero in on the big problems while mm -hmm. having the adoption from the user. Because sometimes that is a big sort of a 
challenge that I know you've seen in your industry and I've seen in my industry is the adoption from the users, right? Mm -hmm. We can build models all day long as a data scientist, mm -hmm. but if we don't have the user in mind from the beginning, you will end up with a very like a curiosity rather than something that moves the needle. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I think like having more like a data, I like this idea of data citizens. Uh, pe everyone should have the tools to build the right models, not necessarily the most complicated models, but the models that allows them to do their job. And then the data science in general could, you know, go mm -hmm. after the big rocks if you want, right? Uh, as you mentioned, the artificial intelligence, the uh, reinforcement learning, where, yeah. but that conversation between the users and the data scientists ensures that whatever you're building can be used and is impactful for the company. So do you feel that uh, machine learning automation will kill data science jobs? Or even like, I mean, we are we are recording this uh, conversation right after the GPT-3 uh, delivery from OpenAI, uh, which it turns that uh, with a, a verbal request, you can you can the algorithm can uh, develop the code for you <laughs> and the application. So, do you feel that that will that's something that will create certain uncertainty uh, and kill some jobs? Or It's going to definitely transform the industry. I don't think it's going to kill jobs. It will transform some of the jobs in the sense that still you need a human to ask the right questions mm -hmm. to the system, right? So it doesn't matter again if you are asking the right questions, the algorithm is going to answer the right is going to give you the right answer to the wrong question so the role of the data scientist is going to be more about identifying the right opportunities and identifying the right questions to ask to the ai which overall is going to in my mind if i had an, a, a, a system that allows me to just say what i want to program and then build that program That will be great because then I can just zero in on what is the actual problem that I want to solve or what is the problem that my, my business partners uh, would benefit most. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, let's see how that future <laughs> yeah. uh, get materialized. I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know how to say that, but... Uh, I see a lot of uh, a large degree of uncertainty um, because I mean, look how weak is the world uh, with this. I mean, I, I'm sure that I, I don't know how you see the pandemic that we are suffering worldwide, but to me, it's a fluctuation. It is a fluctuation, but it is a fluctuation that is changing the whole the whole industry, the society, how we, how everything is set up. Uh, of course, we will get back to something similar, but you see how weak the society became when, when something like, I mean, it's exponential, the, the way that it's an exponential phenomena. But um, so things like that, like a, a, a tiny thing, like an algorithm could shake the whole thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's hard to predict, right? I mean, yeah, it is. It, yeah, it is really hard. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so my, my, my boss from my, my, my previous company said um, he had a um, 13 year old or 14 year old at the time, and he said something that, um, you know, stuck with me. Their jobs have, might not be invented yet. And it's true. We don't know what is the next generation of jobs that are going to be for in the next 10 years, right? So it could be completely different names, completely different functions. Um, and you said it's possible that we have, you know, one breakthrough that is going to change the roles of data science. So how do you protect your future from that uncertainty? What is your strategy? 
Oh my! Yeah, yeah. One one of the uh, um, sort of guiding principles is that it's always a human making the decisions. So the more you un in, in understand how the human makes decisions, the better prepared you are for mm -hmm. for that. Uh, when you have um, uh, at, at the end of the day, right? Any product that you sell is solving a need for a human, right? So if you can understand what a human wants and use the right means, right, right technology to learn about that. That would, that's that's how you can keep up with technology because you're gonna continue answering the the, the right questions. Uh, and when I say you know humans could be your end user, could be your boss, could be their boss of their bosses. You know, is is being able to anticipate what is the right problem or the right question to start asking. Okay, amazing, amazing. So this is my last question, okay? So we call it, uh, we always uh, have this section at the end of the podcast, uh, which is called the quantum question. Okay. So basically, I went to uh, the website of an Australian university. They have a quantum algorithm for generating uh, random numbers, so I select a random number between zero and, and 10. So, and, and I got a number to pick one of the 10 questions that I have here for you. <laughs> All right. So the number was six. I just ran it. The number was six. Uh, it's true what I'm telling you, okay? It's not, I can, I can share the link with you <laughs> later. All right, please, please do so. so. Yeah, yeah. So the number was six, and the sixth, the sixth question is... If you could ask only one question to a super intelligence, what would it be? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> only one question to a super intelligence. Yeah, but you can, wow. you can, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. To be honest, to be honest, uh, just because um, I'm interested on the topic and I always wanted to do is going to be, uh, I would like to, to, to learn a little bit more about the, the actual na nature of dark matter because uh, oh. <laughs> that was my, my, my dissertation in, in, uh, in my PhD. So I really, really want to know, you know, the, the, the actual nature. Of course, they are, we know that it's out there. We know we want to have the direct detection, but I would love to actually know more about the actual uh you know nature of uh dark matter so that will be perhaps yeah that will be my question okay and let me give you, let me uh, a follow-up question do you miss academia oh that's a good, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question uh, i miss i i miss there's a, a lot of stuff that i miss about academia um uh, you know the the pursuit of knowledge for the sake of pursuing knowledge yeah. is something that is <laughs> amazing. You know, like uh, in, in the sense that I, that was my passion to understand the universe and use physics to understand what is around, right? So, and that was the end by itself, right? So, when you are spending many years of your life trying to detect that matter. The end is that, right? Detect that matter. Um, the thing with uh, business is that you can use the same approach, the same questions, not as big as that, but still having the same approach. So I perhaps miss that, you know, the, the fact that you were tackling this very big question for the sake of this is important to know, right? And, and, and what's uh, something that you also enjoy sharing that knowledge with the community and also the future generations? Like, like, did you like, did you enjoy lecturing? Oh, actually, yes. To be honest, uh, one of the things that I enjoy the most is either uh, you know collaborating with my team. When mm -hmm. uh, it, it, right now with uh, in uh, at Home Depot. Uh, if there is any good question that we can apply so machine learning, or not necessarily machine learning, but any statistical, rigorous statistical method to answer a question, is really good when we have this community in your team that collaborate and and, and you can as a as a you know former scientist or scientist right former 
ex experimental astrophysicists sort of guide them through the stuff that you learn that worked in that field. But what I like also about the data science is the, this research connotation, right? Like, uh, yes, we are bringing models that move the needle for the organization, but at the same time, we have an eye on these new developments. So that will be, it's, it's hard to find that sweet spot, but this is the part of the science on data science, right? Beautiful. I, I, I like the way that you see the, the job that we do. And thank you very much for sharing this time with, uh, with us, with our audience too. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. It always is, is, is cool talking to you, uh, Miguel. I hope you can, you can come by Spain someday after this yeah. pandemic. And of course, yes. we, we, we need to meet and, and talk again about the book. Oh, yes, definitely. We need to. We need to. There is some game theory topics that we need to cover. Still, yes, still there. Yes, <laughs> that, That's the next conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, All exactly. Right. <laughs> okay, so let me also thank the audience to be there. Please tell us in the comments or on Twitter at uh, playground underscore AI, who would you like us to invite to the show? or any other question that you will, I, you will uh, want us to ask. Uh, like and subscribe and see you in the next one, players. Until then, please keep an eye on AI. Bye. Bye.